This is Faith Footnotes with Northwestern Publishing House, Episode 3, This Election is Driving Me Crazy. Welcome to Faith Footnotes, Christian Conversations with Northwestern Publishing House. You can find us online at nph.net. My name is Joshua Vick. And I am Tanya Gerbing. And we are your hosts for Faith Footnotes. Like our name suggests, this is a Christian podcast that is all about practical resources for connecting with Christ and Christian living. Typically, we will feature engaging conversations with Christian authors, explore helpful answers to common questions about the Christian life, dig deep into faith-related topics, and more. Welcome to the show, everyone. Believe it or not, we are just a few weeks away from the election, as if you needed another reminder, right? If you're like me, you're probably ready for this whole thing to be over. You're tired of the talk. You're tired of which celebrity is endorsing which candidate. Maybe you're dreading it. Maybe you're worried about who's going to win and if the winning candidate will address the issues that most concern you. Or on the other hand, maybe you're worried that the candidate who wins will address the issues you're most concerned with and end up hurting the country. You're right, Josh, and I am ready for the election to be over. I mute my TV when a political ad starts playing. I'm tired of the nasty social media posts. And I'm very sad to see friends and family fighting over their different political views. And maybe, just maybe, our listeners are feeling this way too. So the question needs to be asked, how can a Christian approach politics? Joining us today to talk about this question is retired pastor Charles Digner, author of the popular Bible study, Politics is Driving Me Crazy, which has been featured in the last four issues of Ford in Christ magazine. Also joining us is Pastor Thomas Cuck, author of the Bible study based on the book, Civil Government, God's Other Kingdom. Pastor Cuck currently serves as pastor at Atonement Lutheran Church in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Yes, thanks for having us. Great to have you both to talk about this tricky but timely topic. So, Pastor Digner, I mentioned that your Bible study, Politics is Driving Me Crazy, has been featured in the last four issues of Forward in Christ magazine. And you're also currently doing an online Bible study this month on the very topic. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I wrote that Bible study quite a while ago. Uh, NPH asked me to write it in 2018 and probably finished it in 2019. And at that time, this uh, political discourse wasn't quite as nasty as it is now. And since then, I, I did a uh, pastoral conference in Michigan on the same subject. We did spend two days talking about politics. And I guess I realized how much it affected our congregations, especially after the pandemic began. You had all of those issues about masking or not masking, and uh, those should have been relatively easy issues for Christians to navigate in their congregations, but it became very, very difficult. And I think one of the reasons it became difficult was it was so wound up in the political conversations that were going across the country at the time. And so it's just the topic of looking at what the Bible says about politics and the difference between church and state, the two kingdoms. I think it's a very healthy Bible study. So, Pastor Cuck, tell us about the Bible study on civil government and its relevance to politics. Well, the Bible study that I wrote is based on Professor Deutschlander's book, Civil Government, God's Other Kingdom. And if you've not read that book, I would encourage you strongly to read it. It is just gold. He did such a great job with it. And my Bible study is written more for a small group, uh, particularly a group that's willing to do some work outside of class. So what they actually do is they read either a chapter or two chapters sometimes of the book outside of class, answer some questions that are provided in the Bible study. And then when you come to class, you have a chance to apply and uh, dig a little deeper and answer questions and have somewhat of an organic discussion. So it's a really good resource for that kind of a kind of a Bible study. And if nothing else, it gets people to read Professor Deutschlander's book. And that in and of itself is worth it because it is so good. So we're in the thick of political season, and I've certainly seen my fair share of TV commercials or the social media posts that are doom and gloom and maybe filled with misinformation, maybe fake news. Pastor Mike Novotny in his book Taboo says, America, it seems, has gone from democracy 
too demo crazy. And it's just such a negative and bitter world sometimes. What encouragement can you offer to our listeners to get through the next few weeks before the election? One of the really good news things is that at the end of the day, God is in charge of all of this stuff. The governments that exist have been ordained by God, and God knows why he puts them there. Um, think back. The Roman government was awful. Some of the things the Roman government did to Christians were heartbreaking and horrible. But do you realize if the Roman government wasn't in place, Mary and Joseph would have never had a census decree that made them go to Bethlehem? The Savior would have been born in the wrong place. And if the Roman government hadn't been in place, there would have been no government doing crucifixion. And Jesus wouldn't have died the way he was supposed to die. That Roman government was playing an incredibly important role in the salvation history of the world. Now, do you think the believers at that time were really happy about the Roman government? I doubt it. I'm sure when they saw their kids sacrificed and some of their homes destroyed and Christians thrown into jail, etc., they were going, God, what's going on? But God knew every step of the way why he was doing what he was doing, because his agenda is always to get the most people to heaven. I don't know who's going to win that up the upcoming election, but I'll tell you this. The day before the election goes, I'm going to send an email to my congregation, which is going to be entitled, We Thank God for the Election Results. And I'm going to send that email before the election happens. It's going to be, We Thank God for the Election Results. Why? Because God knows exactly who the right winning candidate is, whether he's my candidate or not. God knows exactly who the right candidate is, and he will guide things for the good of his people. I think one of the things that you see happening uh, today in the discourse that happens, especially in the news, it's coming at you all the time. And so you, you can't get away from it. And even though there is probably some really heavy political discourse way back when, and it just wasn't around 24-7. So no matter what news station you turn to, you're going to get one side or the other side. And not all of that information is accurate. And so it's just hard to get away from all of that stuff. Uh, and I think it's really important to uh, remember what Pastor Cock just reminded us about is that uh, every authority is instituted by God. And what would we have if we didn't have government? Um, I had an interesting observation from a long time ago. I had a member who flew internationally, so he and his wife flew to Moscow. This is probably the early 1980s, and they said they just loved Moscow because middle of the night they could go out and walk the streets of Moscow. There's absolutely no danger at all, and that's when Russia was the communist nation that, you know, the USSR, and of course the Berlin Wall came down, and you think, how did that happen? Was God in charge or not, right? God was in charge of what he wanted to accomplish, and sometime after that, I had a member of my congregation doing business in Moscow. And when he went to Moscow, he was met at the airport with armed guards and he uh, stayed at a hotel that had a machine gun nest on the roof. And so Moscow had become very, very dangerous. We, we think that the world's going to come to an end if we, we pick the wrong person to become the president of the United States. I'm sorry, is God's going to provide for us. God has given us a country that's got a constitution, there are many layers to government, and there's some of the most beautiful government that you'll find is on the local level. A policeman that will go out of his way to help the people he knows as neighbors in their communities. The, the fear factor that sometimes the media tries to sell is just, we just don't have to buy into that fear factor. There's a beautiful psalm, Psalm 2. Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand against the... And their rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. <laughs> and God is still in charge. So, you know, in the middle of this crazy discourse, we just have to go back to that again and again. Uh, one question I want to ask, though, is I think we all agree it's good to stay informed on the issues. But would you ever advise someone to just take a break from social media or take a break from TV or find some way to get away from all the media? Uh, Pastor Degner, you mentioned that it's tricky to do. Uh, but if someone's struggling, would you ever recommend that they try to do that? I'm not sure it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just because of all the paid television ads, you just you, you can't even watch anything on television right now without getting ads and ads and ads. And I think you 
more than trying to stay away from it and isolate yourself from it, you just need to keep on coming back and saying, you know what? I'm not going to believe that stuff. I'm, I'm just going to believe that God is still in charge, that God already knows who's going to be elected our next president. And whoever that person is, God is going to take care of us in our country. He has a plan. So it's really what you're saying is more of a spiritual mind shift of thinking who's in charge here versus digesting each bit of information that comes through in media, TV commercials, posts, right? Exactly. And sometimes I think because all, everything is a soundbite, um, we're given just a bit of information that's inflammatory. Sometimes it's better for us to do research, whether it's online or, or good sources, to try to dig deeper into what the platforms of the different parties are. If you're looking at how to make a decision, sometimes you just have to dig deeper and ask yourself, which platform, which form of government, which which thoughts and ideas are best going to represent what I believe and what I want for my country? I think a certain amount of it is also is perspective. Uh, do you think Peter, James, and John, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob care who wins this election? No, <laughs> they, they just don't because they're in heaven in glory. And when you and I get to heaven and are in glory, do you think we're going to care who wins the elections on earth? I, I just don't think so. I mean, finally, I don't know. I've not been to heaven yet. Looking forward to getting there. Uh, but that that just eternal perspective that that we have, I think, is also really valuable. So politics always seems to bring division. When conversations turn political, a lot of times discussions turn combative very quickly. What advice can you give to our listeners to live their faith even when political conversations get heated? One of the places that I would go is just to simply remember who you are. You are, first of all, a believer in Jesus. And what is your goal here on this earth? Your goal here on this earth is to grow in the Word of God and to take the Word of God to others. Um, this is my approach to it. You don't have to do this, but I never put a political sign in my yard. I never put a bumper sticker on my car. Why? Because I may be putting an obstacle between me and half of the people around me to share Jesus with them. And do I really want at the last day my neighbor to look at me and say, you never shared Jesus with me and I never talked to you because you supported Trump Harris? I, no, I don't want that. I want to be able to share Jesus with people. And if that means that I take my political leanings and put them into the back somewhere, I think that's wise. And it also helps me to deal with all this stuff because it reminds me of what's really, really, really important. On the day of my death, it is not going to matter who I voted for. What is going to matter is that I believed in Jesus. And when I get to heaven, people are not going to thank me for voting for Harris or Trump. They will thank me for having told them about Jesus and having supported the work of Jesus. And just having that eternal focus of what our purpose is here on this earth, I think is really healthy and very helpful. Uh, I would suggest two things. One is um, listen and remember who might be listening to you. Mm, good point. Uh, listen, you know, before you really have a right to criticize or judge or anything like that, you really ought to listen. Uh, somebody who belongs to a political party that you don't belong to might have some really good uh, reasons for doing that. Um, and they might have some issues that are really dear to their heart that is more supported by that other party. And we have to understand that neither party is perfect by any means. And sometimes I wish I could just like cherry pick which little things from each party <laughs> that I would like to include in, 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 in the pocket or in, in the candidate that I would like to vote for. But we can't do that. We have to sometimes choose one or the other. So when, when you're talking to somebody, just listen and listen all the way through and Get a perspective of who they are and where they come from. And, and when you do that, you'll probably have an opportunity to share Christ with them somewhere along the way. Uh, the other thing I think is not just listening, but listening, being careful about who's listening to us. Because uh, if I imagine we've got a room of four people here, and if I imagine one of you is from that other party, I'm probably going to temper my speech a little bit and I won't speak quite so forcefully, and I'll try to be a little bit more reasonable. And when you're in a group of people at church, someone on your coffee table might be from the other party. Are they going to be very uncomfortable in the discourse on that 
table because it's all one-sided. So remember to listen and remember who's listening to you. I probably should clarify one thing I, I said earlier. Um, just because that's my take that I don't put the yard sign in my yard and all that stuff doesn't mean it's sinful or wrong for Christians to be politically active. And if you want to be politically active, that's totally fine. If you want to run for office, fantastic. God bless you. May it go well. Um, at the same time, even then, remember who you really are. You are not first a Democrat or a Republican or a Green Party or a liberal li libertarian. Um, you are first and foremost a child of the Most High God. And make sure that that comes through most clearly always, no matter what you are, which approach you take on the political things. So how important is it for a Christian to understand their political position from a biblical perspective? There, there are certainly political things that the Bible speaks to. The Bible speaks to the issue of abortion and euthanasia very, very clearly. You shall not murder. And so we will speak to that issue, but we're not speaking to it on that. We're not speaking to that issue on the basis of politics. We're speaking to that issue on the basics of Bible. Uh, things like what marriage is. We're going to speak to it on the basis of what God says and what the Bible says. So in that sense, it's in, it's important. But the Bible just doesn't address a whole bunch of stuff. Tax policy, for example, um, union or not union. I mean, the Bible just doesn't address that stuff. Um, it doesn't give us specific ways to approach like helping the poor. And we're encouraged to do so, but God never tells us the way to do it. And so there's a whole lot of stuff where you just have to approach it from the standpoint of what does our reason say? What, uh, what tends to seem to be the best, wisest way for us to approach this? And so let the Bible speak to what the Bible speaks to, but the rest of the stuff you can only address with, with natural reason. Pastor Koch mentioned the book written by Dan Deutschlander, and he made a big point about the fact that government has to run on natural human reason. It can't really be governed by God's word. And the church, God's kingdom, is empowered and runs on God's word. And I think we have to keep that separate. And there's an interesting little tidbit in the Bible that shows that sometimes the government acts in ways that might be against God's word, but still has to do it. And that's the, the case of divorce in the Old Testament mm -hmm. that Jesus referred to in the New Testament, where Moses said, uh, or the Pharisees said, you know, Moses gave us permission to have a divorce because he said, at least write a certificate of divorce. And Moses was really acting as a civil servant in that case. He wasn't permitting divorce. He was simply saying, look, guys, if you're going to divorce your wives, the least you could do is give her a certificate of the divorce so she knows where she stands. But Jesus comes along and he says, well, Moses was speaking to the hardness of your heart. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, civil government has to speak to the hardness of the human heart and have laws that, that govern people who won't be governed by God's word, will never be governed by God's word. So you have two different ways in which those two kingdoms work. I think Jesus did such a beautiful job when they tried to corner him on that one and said, you know, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? <laughs> and of course, if he said yes, they would report him to the religious authorities. And if he said no, they would report him to the civil authorities. And Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and what God what belongs to God. And Jesus took that middle ground where he said, you can do both. You don't always have to be do one or the other. Sometimes you can do both. So I, I think that Christians have to use their, their consecrated common sense when it comes to elections. Their consecrated common sense. So how can conversations with other people be an opportunity to witness your faith? Well, I always look at it. I, I'm going to come back to what I said earlier. If I remember who I really am that I am not first an American citizen. I am an American citizen. I'm very thankful I'm an American citizen. I've had a chance to travel to some other countries. I like living here. This is a good place. And to thank God for it, for sure, for sure, and the freedoms that we have. But at the end of the day, I'm a child of God, and I'm going to heaven, and I have eternal purpose and worth. And if I keep that in mind, it's just going to help in the way that the conversations happen. And hopefully, I'll be able to move from, you know, no matter which party we elect, there's going to be troubles we have to have some answers to these things. Here are the answers to the real problems. Things like sin, the biggest problem of all is death. 
And here's the answer to it. It's Jesus and his death and resurrection. So to maybe take it from what I would call a lower level conversation about politics and raise the bar to say there's something way more important. Let's talk about it. I think in the, some of the current conversations uh, in the media, people say things like, um, you have to vote for so-and-so in order to save democracy <laughs> or to save our country. And, and I think sometimes that's a good opportunity to say, you know what, um, I don't know any one individual who can possibly save our country. First of all, it's a big country and there are a lot of layers to it and one person can't do it by themselves. But more importantly, I think that we have a, a God and the Savior that's behind the scenes. And that, that's where I put my trust. And I think by confessing your faith in a God who's guiding things and directing things, but more importantly, sent his son Jesus to die for us. I mean, really, what do we have to be worried about? Why should we be afraid? As you were talking there, Pastor Digner, I was reminded of the Psalm passage. I think it's Psalm 146, which says, Do not put your trust in princes who are but mortal. And so often in politics, we're pushed towards, this is the candidate, this is the candidate. I'm 58, and so I think I probably voted in about 12, 14 presidential election, something like that. I'm pretty sure every single one of them said this was the most important election ever. <laughs> And I'm pretty sure none of them were probably the most important election ever. And God knew the outcome of each and every one of them and has kept his kingdom moving forward in the way that he knew was uh, was best. So put your trust in the Son of God who is immortal, not in any political candidate or your doctor or your investment banker or whoever it is that you may be putting that we may be putting our trust in. If you imagine yourself at a church and you hear you know, the word of God read and you sing songs and all of a sudden the pastor gets up there and starts telling you who to vote for. What dangers are there in that? And is there a place in church for that kind of thinking or that kind of rhetoric? I don't know if I should be blunt. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. I was going to be. <laughs> um, I would probably walk out and then come back later and ask the pastor if he really, really wanted to bring that up in church. If we become political, especially one-sided political, where we're actually supporting one candidate over another, you, you have to understand that you've just lost half your mission field. Mm -hmm. I mean, really? You want to just eliminate half your mission field? Um, and probably half the congregation would walk out behind me. Uh, so I, I just don't think that that kind of politics belongs in the pulpit at all. In fact, I think it's, you actually threaten your tax exemption, exempt. tax exemption as a congregation if you support one candidate. There may be times when you have to talk about issues, and some of those issues cross the line from being political to being uh, spiritual. I mean, the issue of abortion, you can't really talk about that in a neutral way. You have to apply both law and gospel to that. And there are other issues like that as well. So, you know, I can see talking about certain issues, but even then I think you have to be careful that you don't just hit all of the political issues that are current at the time where you play your hand and you're saying, well, I'm only going to be looking at the issues that affect this party. There might be some issues that affect the other party that you're ignoring. I think one of the tragedies in 20th and 21st century America has been how much time, effort, and energy the church at large, now I'm not talking about our synod, I'm talking about the church at large, has invested into political stuff. It is, a, it is a shame because what happened? Instead of talking about Jesus and salvation and eternity and law and gospel, we were talking about tax policy and whether or not we support the Green New Deal or whether or not we're, we're, we're for cutting taxes or whatever. Wow, that we, put our, that we put our focus on the temporal and laid aside the eternal? That's tragic. Um, I spent the first 22 years of my ministry in the South and some of the Southern churches are very, very into politics. And there was a group who would regularly drop off voters guides to our church. We didn't ask for them. They just came. And I gave strict uh, instruction to my secretary. If you beat me here and those things are outside, you put them in the trash as fast as you can. And if I was there first, that's where they went as fast as they could, because that is not where politics should be talked about. This is the place to talk about Jesus. 
And what's very interesting is when we talk about Jesus and eternity and law and gospel stuff, guess what happens? Good citizens get built because God changes hearts. And when God changes hearts, not only does that change the heart, but it also impacts the outward behavior. The government can only deal on the outward behavior stuff. And so how foolish to put too much attention onto outward behavior stuff when we've got heart things that we can address through the powerful word of God. One viewpoint that I think has been gaining a lot of attention in recent years is Christian nationalism. The the thought where the United States is a Christian country, so if we should have our laws rooted in Christianity or mixing the two together. And it almost becomes where if you're a good citizen, you have to be a Christian. What are your thoughts about that? And and do you see any dangers in that kind of thinking? Again, should we be blunt? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, there are all kinds of dangers in, in, in that thinking. Um, every government to some extent is a Christian government, but not for the reason that most people probably think. The reason every government is to some extent and to a great extent a Christian government is because of the natural knowledge of God that God has written his law on our hearts. And that's why you go anywhere in the world and there are laws against stealing and murder and lying and all that kind of stuff, which comes right out of the Bible. Why? Because God wrote his law on our hearts. And so because of that, every government to some extent will follow those sorts of things. But to think that somehow Christianity matches up with a political party is just super dangerous. And I'll go back to what I said earlier, is it means we're putting the temporal in place of the eternal. We want our focus to be on eternal stuff. And so that Christian nationalist idea is really dangerous. That wasn't really short for a blunt answer, was it? That could have probably been shorter than that. <laughs> Maybe Pastor Dagner can do better. Well, I don't even know if I sometimes argued that uh, our country was built on Christian principles. I'm not sure that many of the founders really understood Christianity that well. Uh, Thomas Jefferson was, I think, a deist. Uh, I don't think he would have, we would actually call him a Christian. And so to say that, you know, there's some kind of a national Christianity. The other thing is, practically, things like, oh, let's get prayer back in public schools. You know, that just wouldn't work very well in Utah for our Christian people, because it's probably going to be more Mormon-based than anything else. And um, so who do you want leading the Christian prayer? There needs to be a separation between church and state. I think the Bible teaches that's very, very well. If I can make a plug for Professor Deutschlander's book again, he does a really nice job of discussing the tools that God has given to both the church and the state. That God has given the church, the gospel, and the good news of Jesus, the powerful word of God, which is great at changing hearts and putting people on the road to eternity. God has given the government the sword. What is the sword really good at doing? It's really good at killing people or keeping law and order. And that's what the government is really good at. So if the church tries to do state stuff, it's going to mess it up because we've got the wrong tool. And if the government tries to do church stuff, like prayer in school, for example, in public school, the government can only mess it up because it's got the wrong tool. It's got the sword, which is, like I said, really good at cutting people's heads off or keeping law and order forced in a forced sort of a manner. Just a great aspect of Professor Deutschlander's book that you'd have a chance to explore in that Bible study. I think there are a lot of people who are dreading the outcome of this election. What can a Christian consider when the candidate they support loses? I'm going to go back and repeat what I'm going to do with my congregation before the election. They're going to get an email that says, we thank God for the election results. Why? Because the governments that exist have been ordained by God. And when I remember God has his reasons, I don't have to know what they are. God has his reasons. That's going to allow me to rest at night and go on to the next day. I, I like to go back in the history of the world uh, uh, through the Bible and look at some of the people that God chose uh, to be leaders. You know, he chose Cyrus, king of Persia, who was not a Christian, mm -hmm. uh, to one day wake up and say, you know, we ought to send the children of Israel back to the promised land and we'll help them build their temple. It's like, where did that come from? Um, so God used this non-Christian person, this non-unbelieving person, for his will to be done. And you find that throughout the Old Testament. And even in the New Testament, uh, Pastor Cock talked about 
some of the things that the Romans did. Uh, well, the fact that they built those beautiful roads all over the empire mm-hmm. meant that the Apostle Paul could walk from one country to another. And with his citizenship, he had carte blanche to go everywhere he wanted to go. Uh, so God was in control of those things, um, no matter who gets elected. So why should we be afraid? And God always rules with a different agenda than what we have. God's agenda is always to get as many people as possible to heaven. And if that means that a certain candidate needs to win or lose, thank God, because it means more people are going to get to heaven. And if you remember that that's his agenda as he rules things, it's just so helpful because it lifts our eyes to a whole different sphere, which is eternal and wonderful. And those answers that both of you just gave are very different than sometimes you hear people say, oh, if this person gets elected, I'm leaving the country. (laughs) And, you know, with that Christian mindset, it's a totally different perspective than just running away or giving up or shutting down or whatever, whatever you might want to do. A lot to unpack here today. I just want to give time for a final word. So if you could give our listeners one thing to keep in mind over the next few weeks, what would that one thing be? I, I, I don't know if I can boil it down to one thing, but I'll, I'll give two things. And that's that, number one, uh, you have a God in heaven who rules all of this. He's got this in his control. He's known forever how it's going to be, and he knows what it will be. He's in charge. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Pastor Degner had quoted from Psalm 2. So true. He's got it. And number two, remember who you are, that you are the eternal children of the eternal God, and he loves you dearly. Just remember the promises in the Bible that, uh, you know, like Psalm 46, you know, even if war breaks out against us, we will not fear. We have all those promises that uh, our life in this world, as well as in the next world, are governed, are promised by God who loves us and will make all things work out for our good. So why should we be afraid? Well, thank you, Pastor Degner and Pastor Cock, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. You can find the show notes and links to all the resources discussed on today's show at blog.nph.net. Let us know what your biggest takeaway from today's show was in the comments section. Be sure to follow our show on your preferred podcast platform. We will be posting a new episode each month. And next month, of course, is Thanksgiving. In addition to eating a crazy amount of food, it's a chance for Christians to give thanks to God. But is one day enough? Joining us next time is Pastor Schreyer, author of 364 Days of Thanksgiving. Thanks for listening to this episode of Faith Footnotes from Northwestern Publishing House. Keep the conversation going by visiting nph.net.